Hello, everyone. This is David Moore of Equity Advantage. We'll be getting started in just a moment. Actually, it's time right now. We'll go ahead and get started. Don't want you guys that are on time to be, be waiting for those that are not. So uh, David Moore, Equity Advantage, thank you very much for joining us today. And we've got some stories for you today on 1031. So the, if, if you take a look at your menu off the right side of the screen, there is a section on, on, on that menu for questions. I probably will not get to them during the presentation. We typically will address those at, at a later date. We'll be sending the response to those questions out when you get uh, the paperwork from Celia at the end of the day. But uh, you know, my background is real estate investment. Uh, I got into the exchange business 30 years ago. Uh, my brother and I uh, grew up in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. Santa Cruz actually moved to Oregon in 1990 to buy real estate. And when we got here, we needed exchange work done and uh, couldn't find anybody to do it. So we put Equity Advantage together uh, in, in uh, 1991. And uh, then during the ensuing years, we had many clients coming to us wanting to use IRA and 401k funds to uh, further uh, expand their real estate empires, I guess. And uh, so we put a company, sister company together called IRA Advantage uh, about a dozen years ago, and it handles uh, those uh, requirements, people that uh, want to take and further expand or diversify their, their IRA 401k portfolios. But today we're going to tell some stories. We're going to talk about uh, holding periods because I think that's very important in today's world. We're going to talk a little bit about seller carrybacks. We're going to talk briefly about uh, you know combining funds, uh, IRA 401k funds with 1031 probably. And since there's been so much talk about 1031, in uh, President Biden's initial proposals, tax proposals pre-COVID, you got to remember this stuff was pre-COVID. He had uh, discussed getting rid of 1031 or uh, modifying it to a point where it would only be allowed for people that made $400,000 or, or less in a year. And you know, I think that's where I'm I'm sort of concerned about it because I don't want to, uh, you know the politicians seem to be real good at separating us, dividing us, and making us fight these days. So. I don't want people to think, gee, you know, I don't make 400,000, so I'll be able to continue using the exchange. Well, think about every time you sell a property, that gain on that disposition gets put on top of what you made. And, and I would throw out there that, that in today's world, at least on the coasts, uh, there are very few transactions where you've got a situation where that 400 wouldn't be a problem. But uh, anyway, without further ado, we're going to get started. And if you've got questions, like I said, I might uh, probably not going to address them online, but if you've got them, please don't hesitate to put them out there. The only dumb question is one that's not asked. So uh, here we go. We'll get started right now. And I, I really, uh, first frame, we're, we're going to talk about, we're going to talk about uh, what was proposed. And, and like I said, uh, Biden's initial proposals, we, the other thing that made us very uneasy was the elimination of stepped up basis. But uh, Keith Lampe is, is uh, CEO of Inland Private Capital. Inland has about 60% of that DST market. They've been in the business, uh, different uh, divisions of that company have been in the real estate uh, business for 52 years. And, uh, you know, they and, and Pasco were involved with the actually create, creation of the DST product. But, you know, the bottom line is Keith was able to have an audience with a lot of the president's top advisors. And after over an hour's conversation, uh, he left that meeting with the uh, opinion that uh, there were much, much more important things on the table uh, for the Biden uh, presidency than, than Elimination 1031 and that uh, some of those proposals were really just maybe to calm the winds out there. But at this point in time, I, every time that we turn around, we see somebody giving a presentation on what's going to be going on with tax law and everything. And, and really, I don't think anybody knows anything at this point. So I'm not going to spend much more on this other than to say, if you're concerned about 1031 survival, please uh, reach out, take a look at uh, 1031taxreform.com. It's put together by the Federation of Exchange Combators, which is our industry's trade organization. You know, the FEA, the exchange industry is a very small one. NAR is one of our big partners, obviously. And, and uh, you know, we've got other associations that are much, much bigger and much more helpful. But, you know, we can use all the help we can get. If you're concerned about 1031 being around in the future, 
please don't hesitate to take a look at 1031taxreform.com. And uh, there's a whole list of, of people to reach out to there. One last comment on 1031 on the ropes. We have a presentation scheduled for February 17th. Uh, Senior Vice President of Government Affairs at Inland is, is a gentleman named Dan Wagner, and he'll be presenting uh, an update on uh, where everything's headed at that point. So February 17th, 10 a.m. Pacific time, if you're interested in, in attending that webinar, please uh, sign up. And it's gonna be some very valuable information. And, and Dan does a wonderful job in his presentations. And uh, you know, he, he's gonna be straight from the horse's mouth what they know at that point in time. So obviously things are moving along and uh, we're gonna get information out as timely as, as we receive it. So why do we even think about an exchange? 1031 has been around for a hundred years. And, and, and you know, it's sort of interesting when I got in the business uh, the guy that uh, mentored me was a gentleman named Ron Stash. He he had uh, founded uh, at that point in time in the late 80s, uh, the largest exchange company in the business, uh, Starker Services, and, and he had uh, you know, sold a, a controlling interest in that company when we had that World Series earthquake. But uh, he, he was a retired uh, investment broker before that, and you know, very interesting guy. And and he would uh, we'd sit in his little minivan, ride back and forth from from Santa Cruz, California to Salem, Oregon, or Olympia. And and uh, you know, the reason we were going those places is the market had turned in in roughly '88, and state capitals typically lag the rest of a state's economy. So we were headed to Salem and and, and Olympia. But, you know, we'd sit there in that minivan going back and forth and there'd be 10, 12 hour, 14 hour downloads of information. And it was very, very informa informational and a lot of fun. Uh, and, and, you know, he'd sit there and coach us on how to make offers, do this and that and whatever was going on. But uh, obviously the, the 1031 was core to all of that. And the reason 1031 is so important is if you look at gain, people need to understand gain has absolutely nothing to do with profit. The reason 1031 is there is it's going to defer that gain. It's it's not tax elimination. The only way you get rid of it is is through swapping till you you drop. We call it, and that's you know one of those things that that's sort of on the chopping block is that stepped up basis situation. Because if you swap till you drop at the end of the day, your heirs could receive receive a stepped up basis on those properties, and they could turn around the next day and sell with no tax consequence. So it's it's a big part of of what we do. You know, and if you look at other things, IRAs, 401k plans, that's tax deferred growth. Uh, at the end of the day, anytime you're pulling anything out, you're gonna pay normal income tax on that stuff. So it's a little bit different there. But if we look at gain and, and something that really is, is important to understand is gain is simply the difference between your basis and the adjusted sales price. Your basis is the purchase price plus capital improvements minus depreciation. And you're gonna subtract that number from the adjusted sales price and that's going to give you your gain. Now, the thing that's so so tricky about it all is it, that first number, if you look at basis, first thing, the purchase price. Well, it's not always the purchase price because what happens if you look at Section 1034 that was replaced with Section 121 in 1997 for the sale of a primary residence, 1034 was a basis carry forward. 1033, involuntary conversion, it's a basis carry forward. 1031 is a basis carry forward. So if you acquired property using any of those three, your basis, uh, the initial number there is not the purchase price of that property. You would have had basis carry forward from future or previous investments. Furthermore, you start looking at improvements. And I sit there on the phone with people all day, every day, and I, I ask them, okay, during the time you owned the property, did you do any capital improvements to it? Oh, I did this, I did that, all these things they talk about. And then I had, well, did you write anything off? Oh yeah, I wrote it all off. Well, you expensed it, you didn't capitalize it. So, you know, expense items don't impact the basis, uh, capitalized items do. The next, uh, the next uh, topic, depreciation. Well, during the time you owned the property, did you take depreciation on it? What's the government's position on it? Well, you should have taken it, therefore you did. So it's possible, and this is, this. I'm gonna throw back real quick. We're just, as an exchange company, we're just one person on a successful team of investor uh, counsel. And, and I'm gonna say good, competent tax counsel is probably about the most important. Uh, when you've got investment properties, you don't want to be doing that tax work yourself. You want somebody, you're going to pay somebody that knows this stuff. Their job is to keep your money yours. 
And we like to say, you worked hard for your money. We work hard to keep it yours. Your tax people are going to do that every day for you. And you know, a lot of times I hear people say, well, yeah, that CPA costs a lot. Well, not using the CPA is going to cost you a lot more. And by the way, do not call them up April 14th and tell them you did that reverse leasehold improvement exchange, something like that. Talk to them before you ever sell anything. Talk to them before you ever list it. Understand what your tax liability is going to be on disposition before you ever put it on the market. And that's going to arm you with a lot of valuable information. Uh, that gain on that property is going to dictate whether or not you want to do an exchange or whether or not you need to do an exchange. And you've got to look at the gain on a property and maybe you've got offset losses somewhere else. So you, you can really need to look at gains and losses all the time and understand how to use your money the most effectively. And that's why I say good, competent tax people are critical. I'm going to put that team of people, the, the good tax uh, tax lawyer on there, uh, brokers, title escrow people, finance people. You need people that are going to take care of you. You know, the finance world can be filled with landmines these days. Uh, I would say in, in areas like uh, I'm in Portland. Well, I would really cringe to be managing my own assets in Multnomah County these days. I think you really need to have professional management just to keep you out of a liability situation. I mean, it's getting so tricky. The tenants have all the rights. The property owner has very little. So know what, know what you can and can't do. And that's where that property management company is going to be. But, you know, appraisers, inspectors, you, you, you know the story. Have that good team of people together. But if we look at this basis and gain, that's what's going to justify the exchange. 1031 is not all or nothing. So you're going to choose to defer what you choose to defer. The one thing I want to point out in the middle of that page is phantom gain. OK, we've had a great run up. And, uh, you know, who knows what to where we go in the next few years. But if we have a situation where we might have some erosion of values, it's possible phantom gain occurs when you've got a, 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 a debt over basis situation. So you can have a gain on a on a, even a foreclosure of a property. So if in a short sale or foreclosure, if the debt is greater than the uh, if the debt's greater than the basis, you're going to have that debt is treated as a sales price and you're going to have that same formula up there. Gain the adjusted sales price minus the basis. So unlike a primary residence where you've got some tax relief on income properties, you do not. So we had uh, lots of situations, uh, unfortunately, during the, the last crash, 07, 08, and we were doing cleanup work actually until the last two, three years uh, where we had phantom gain situations. So make sure you talk, talk to your tax people, talk to them, not at tax return time, but talk to them before you're ever selling things, understand what you're gonna be looking at. So what's it cost? I mean, you're, you're typically looking at federal tax rates and, and understand once again, there, were, there was talk about elimination of, of the capital gains tax rates, bumping them back up to normal income tax rates. But in today, uh, today's uh, numbers, we've got appreciations taxed at, at 20%, depreciation recaptured at 25%. If you're uh, living in a state with state uh, tax, you're going to put that on top. And then finally, we've still got the health care tax at the 3.8 on top. So uh, understand for a property qualify for 1031, it just has to have been acquired and held as an investment property. And uh, we're going to talk about hold periods a little bit more in a few minutes. But the thing is that you could be in a situation where maybe you held the property for under a year. And the rates I just mentioned are long term capital gains tax rates. Assets held for under a year, you're going to be looking at normal income tax rates, but 1031 does not contain a black and white required hold period. So it's possible that you could do an exchange even on an asset that was held for less than a year, but you're going to be looking, if, if you just chose to sell it, you're going to be looking at normal income tax instead of the long-term capital gains tax. So the bottom line is before you ever, uh, I would say, be, people ask me all the time, when do I want people to think about the exchange? I'm going to say before you ever list the property, when you consider listing, understand what your basis is, what your gain is, and then you can make that intelligent decision uh, whether you want to do the exchange and or at what point uh, the exchange ceases to make sense. Maybe you're doing a partial exchange. Maybe you're going down in value. Maybe you're pulling some money out. So anytime we've got a situation where boot, boots, anything that's received that's not of like kind, anytime you've got boot that exceeds the total gain, there's absolutely no benefit to do the exchange. But if you want to pull some money out of that transaction, that's fine. You just got to know when you can do it. And, and you're just going to, it's just going to trigger a partially deferred exchange. 
So the bottom line is people are going to work their whole life. They're going to build an investment portfolio, whether it's in, in, in real estate and, and utilizing 1031 or Wall Street using IRAs and 401k funds. But you, you really don't want to pay the tax at some point. So you're going to continue to do it. So at the end of the day, uh, last month, I gave a presentation on end games and uh, it was all about places to go at the end of the day. And, and you know, that's that's one of those questions you ask. At what point do you step out? What do you want to do with your money? How is it going to work for you best? And, and we've got a situation where maybe you're timing a sale. Maybe you've got losses, to offset gains, so on and so forth. 1031 is not always going to be the right choice. And you know, I would say you know, many times in, in down markets, we've got a situation where those with the gold make the rules, those with the gold have the opportunities. And you know, the biggest issue with a 1031 is time. You've only got that 45 day ID period, total of 180 days to get it done. And it forces you to keep going. And there are many situations where you can document really that 1031's uh, been responsible for values that are in excess of what they should be. Because if someone gets into a transaction and you get outside the 45 days and you, you have to make a deal go, you know, what's going to happen if you if you don't make that happen? If you're you're looking at maybe paying 20,000 too much for a property, but your tax hits 100,000, what are you gonna do? You're gonna pay the extra money. So make sure you, you really, uh, minimize the impact of time to the best of your ability. So timing the transactions is always going to be critical. If I came to you and said, if you're a broker, hey, I'd like to list this property with you and you list it for me and I tell you I want to do an exchange and next Tuesday, somebody's got cash, they want to close the property next Friday, the first response, hey boy, that was great, that was easy. Do I really want it to close next Friday though if I don't know where I'm going to go? So the bottom line is ask for the time you need and, and it's, it's your job to ask, it's the other person's job to say no, but take the time, work to get where you want to go and, you know, keep your money working for you as long as you choose to keep it working for you. Uh, by the way, this presentation is going to be posted on our YouTube channels and also you can request a PowerPoint of it, uh, actually a PDF of it, uh, Celia Seymour at uh, 1031exchange.com, C-M-O-O-R-E at 1031exchange.com. She'll be sending out copies of the presentation, so you have it for reference at a later date. Here's, here's a few things that people just always look at, and, and it just drives me crazy, some of this stuff. And, and if I go back to 1991 when I got into the business, I had a lot more hair, hair on my head, but I was a lot younger guy. And, and I remember vividly giving presentations, people come up, well, I remember when a like kind meant house for house, land for land, so on and so forth. And it's never been that way. It's been proposed that it would be that way several times but it's never been that way. Like kind refers to the nature of the investment rather than the form. We'll talk about like kind a little bit further in, in, a, in a couple pages, but bottom line, you can go from, from dirt into uh, apartment buildings, office buildings, a place the beach to retire into, all those things are gonna be fine. Uh, two, section 1031 does not require a two-year hold. Okay, it, it does not require a two-year hold. I'm, I'm telling you that. And, and so often people look at the code and they say, well, it says two years in there. And, and it does not. It, it says two years in a related party transaction. But even in a related party transaction, it's not an absolute. If you can document there was no intent to avoid tax, even if I'm swapping properties with my brother, it does not have a required two-year hold. Uh, I would encourage that when we're looking at related party transactions, we've got a, a series of other things we're looking at, but in a nutshell, related party transactions, you could sell a related party, you could not buy from a related party in an exchange unless that other party is also doing the exchange and each of you plan to hold the prop, each of your respective properties for no less than two years, with the exception of you if you can prove document there was no intent to avoid tax all right three there is no limit to the number of properties relinquished or received now people always say the code says three the code says three well the id rules one of the three identification rules states three okay there's three different identification rules the first one says you can id more than three properties uh, value is irrelevant. Second ID rule, you can exceed three, you can exceed, uh, well, I'm gonna go, I'm so excited about talking about, it. I'm gonna go to the third rule. So first property, three rules, 
Second uh, property ID rule is 200% rule, says you can ID more than three properties, cannot exceed 200% of the relinquished property's value. Third rule says you can exceed three, you can exceed 200% in value, but you, you have to acquire 95% of the aggregate value of all properties ID. That means you're buying everything you identify. My advice is get the deal done inside the 45 days. None of these rules really impact you at all. But really in today's world, make sure on that 45th day, you're either totally committed to completing the exchange or you're gonna terminate it. We'll talk about when you can get money out of an exchange in a few minutes. But it, for example, opportunity zones, okay? An OZ has 180 days from disposition that you can put money into an opportunity zone. So let's imagine that you ID properties and you're now outside the 45 days and you don't wanna buy any of those properties that have been ID and you'd like to slide the money into an opportunity zone. Well, we as the exchange company cannot give you the money until you've purchased everything you have the right to buy. So that OZ opportunity is not gonna be an opportunity unless it's still there after day one. Well, it's not period because I can't give you the money uh, 181 days later and get you into it. So be aware that, that those uh, timelines, the identification rules, they're all very, very hard. Number four, you can carry a note or land sales contract and still do a 1031 exchange. Lots of times people say, well, I'm gonna carry paper and I've been told I can't do an exchange if I do that. Well, we're gonna talk about that. There's literally five different ways you can still do an exchange with seller carrybacks, all right? Number five, you do not have to replace debt in a 1031. This happens over and over and over again. And anytime we're in a recessionary period, what happens? You've got a decreased value, which decreases the equity in a property. And typically you've got tighter lending requirements. So you've got an increase in, in, in capital required to buy that replacement property. So reduced loan to value. So I'll have people call up say, well, gee, I don't want any debt on the replacement property or I want less debt on the replacement property. Do I have to pay off or pay down the relinquished property before closing it? And the answer is absolutely not. Debt can go away two ways. One by going down in value triggers tax because you went down in value. The other way debt goes away is by adding cash, which is always going to be fine. Finally, 1031 is not all or nothing defer as much as you want. It's, it's, if you have a situation where you've got uh, you know, 500,000 in gain and, and, and you sold a, a million dollar property with a basis of 500 and you, your perfect replacement property is 750, buy it if that's what you want. You're gonna defer tax on $250,000 of gain uh, and you're gonna have tax exposure on 250,000. So the difference between the million and the 750, that's a reduction value, which triggers tax exposure, uh, but you're still, every dollar spent over your basis represents tax deferred gain. So once again, you might have losses to offset the gains. You might just not wanna buy as much property. You might want money out to do whatever you wanna do. That is all fine. Buy what you want. Every dollar more you spend on something that you want costs you a dollar. If you don't spend it, Maybe it's 40, 45 cents. When we put this business together, we went through a whole bunch of paperwork, a whole bunch of closings, a whole bunch of things, and we came up with some numbers that were pretty interesting. We, we came up with a 64%, 64% of the properties on the market could or should be exchanged. You think, well, gee, 1031 applies to real property help for investment. How many homes? are out there you know what what else what fits what doesn't fit every time you go to sell a property if you look at this chart it's typically going to fall between one of these two two codes or it might cover both codes things that fall outside this are, are dealer property uh dealer status properties or involuntary conversion or something where you may maybe you didn't hold, hold the home primary residence for long enough to have it fit section 121. So section 121 replaced uh, 1034 in, in, like I said, 1997. And uh, what uh, section 121 says, is if you live in a home for two out of the preceding five years, you've got $250,000 exclusion, individually a half million as a married couple. Uh, prorations are not allowed on that unless uh, there's some hardship for situation. But, uh, you know, for a property qualify, like I said, you have to have lived in it for two out of the preceding five years. 1031 applies to any property held for investment. And uh, unlike Section 121, where it's straight exclusion, 1031 requires the exchange to be structured 
and then you're you're going to need to uh, acquire like-kind real property, satisfy the identification rules, uh, the napkin test, which is value equity requirements. And uh, as long as you do all those within those timelines, and then you're going to defer the gain, the base gets carried forward, where 121 is just a straight exclusion on gain. Now, when 121 got put in place in the late 90s, 250 or 500 in gain meant something. Uh, today, for many of our clients in the, on the different coasts, uh, the 250 or 500 really does little for the disposition on a home. And, and understand, like I said, 121 applies anything that fits that, that two out of five requirement where 1031 applies to something as it is at time of disposition. So you could you could have a home. A lot of times, people's first home ends up their first investment property. So they, they buy the home. They you know they get married. They have a kid. It's too small. They move out. Keep it as a as a rental, and then they you know go buy their new home. As long as they sold that home within three years of of moving out of it, they're still entitled to the exclusion. So, like I said, 121 doesn't necessarily mean they're living in it at time of disposition. It's just whether it fits a two out of five. 1031 applies directly to what it is at time of disposition. But consider a home where that gain is well in excess of the 250 or 500. Well, what's to, you could move out of the property. As long as you sell it within three years of moving out, you're still entitled to the 250 or 500. The overage could be, the gain could be deferred in the replacement property via 1031. We're going to go through an extreme example of that, but it's a real transaction we did years ago. Uh, where an individual came to us, they had you know a, a million dollar tax hit, and 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 uh, I mean literally a million in, in in tax, and we took them from that situation to no tax hit, bought 24 different replacement properties. We'll talk about that transaction, but you know that that was a happy client, and uh, it really got them uh, got them where they wanted to go. So look at those two codes. 1033 is involuntary conversion. If you've got property, some municipality is going to take it. You've got a different set of rules. You don't need us. It, it's, it's more attractive if, it, it's, uh, if it's an involuntary conversion situation. You've got much greater timelines and, and some other uh, valuable opportunities that 1031 does not offer. But you could have a property that's both these two. Imagine a, a, you know, a great example would be a home with a, you know, a, a home office. So think about the number of people today that are working from their home. Now, you might have done tax work at the end of the year. You might have talked to your tax counsel, and you might have discussed having a home office. Well, with all good comes a, a, a bad. If you start treating that home office as a home office, taking depreciation on it, you've done it for more than... You know, let's say uh, you know three out of the last five years. Now you're in a situation if you sold your home, that home office would have to be exchanged. That doesn't get thought of very often. So typically, you're going to look at a, a blended property, maybe a duplex, half owner occupied, half non owner occupied. Maybe you've got a bed and breakfast. Maybe you've got a large home with acreage. Same situation. You've got an allocation to the home. You're going to maximize 121. The balance will go 1031. Same thing with duplex. Same thing with your home with a home office. So be aware all of those things uh, come up and provide opportunities or pitfalls. But you've got to arm yourself with the information that's out there. If you've got questions on any of this anytime, please don't hesitate to reach out. So keeping that last slide in mind. Questions to consider, is the property a primary residence or an investment? Could it be both? Are you going to reinvest the sale proceeds into the real estate? If so, why would you pay the tax? So, I mean, understand 1031's tax deferral, selective tax deferral. Uh, you know, why pay a tax if you don't have to? If, if you're just buying real estate to hide from a tax, I'd argue maybe you shouldn't do that. But it's out there, 1031's there, it's been there for 100 years, why not use it if it's gonna fit your situation? Uh, do you know whether taxes are due on the sale of your property? As I said earlier, that tax counsel is very, very important. Talk to them, use them, ask them the questions, understand in a disposition what the tax hit's going to be. And then you can rationalize where you're going. If you're doing an exchange, and let's say you want to exchange out of this uh, investment property into a place that someday you're going to retire into, and if you ask me how long I'd like to see you hold that property, I'm probably going to tell you a year. Uh, based upon you know a couple of different factors, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if you're living someplace else for a year, there's a cost to that. So what does that cost versus 
uh, what your tax is going to be on that transaction. And if it's better off that you pay the tax, why would you put your life on hold to save roughly the same amount or maybe less in some cases? So understand, rationalize what you're doing, understand what the tax consequence is going to be. And if the exchange works, great. But if it doesn't, don't try to you know cram that square peg in the round hole. Are you holding the property primarily for resale? Now we all hear ads and uh, see ads uh, on flipping property. You know, we've all heard that ad that seems to be tailor-made for each community we live in, and it's sort of entertaining. No matter where you are, it seems to make sense, right? They're telling you, "Hey, it works." But the bottom line is, dealer property does not fit 1031. Dealer property has another problem: it's taxed no matter how long it took you to do that project. You're looking at normal income tax. So I'm not a fan of flipping properties. I, I'm a fan of a, of a modified flip. And I hear people using different acronyms describing it, but they always forget the exchange at the end. So you know, I think we, we some on, on different websites, you see Burr, I think it is. But you know, the bottom line is I was taught, I've been doing it for 30 years. You know, you're gonna handle the exchange, you're gonna buy a property, you're gonna rework it, you're gonna renovate it as you need you're going to stabilize it with and get a tenant in there get the rent stabilized you're going to do a cash out refi and the money via the refi typically is, is going to be uh, about the same or often more than what you you'd be netted with uh, after paying taxes so why not buy the property work on it get it stabilized do the cash out refi buy what you want to do you know through leveraging that money and then a year or two after acquisition maybe three years later Typically, you're going to look at you know maybe two to five year hold on stuff before your equity gets to a point where it no longer makes sense to keep that property. But you always got that choice: the cash out refi or the exchange or both. But at, at the at the end of the day, that decision between a cash out refi and uh, 1031 is going to be driven by one question: Can you do anything else with that property to maximize return? And that gentleman, Ron Stash, that I mentioned earlier. He drove me crazy. We, we, my brother and I go buy a property, fix it up, get it all stabilized and go, when are you gonna get rid of that thing? We're all happy. We, we had a nice return on it. Everything looked good. And he's like, you wouldn't buy that today. How much money you have in there? We tell him and he'd say, well, that's too much. You can't afford your yields. You know, you, your, your return on investment doesn't work any longer. You can't afford to keep it. And we'd look at and cringe. And of course, then we'd have to put on the market, do an exchange. But you know, we're always holding things long enough to satisfy the exchange requirements, help for resale uh, does not fit. So we're gonna talk about determining dealer status a little bit later, Clarkowski court case. I use it for determining dealer status in 1031. I also use it for, uh, let's say, unrelated uh, taxable, un unrelated business taxable income on retirement accounts. But uh, you know, it's just nine points that are used to determine dealer status. But you understand what you're doing, and what the tax ramifications are going to be on those things and you know flipping property you, you've got tax exposure so you, it doesn't fit 1031 and you're looking at normal income tax on disposition so don't do it that's my advice maybe you have to a few times when you're getting started you got to live on something obviously but that's where that refi money comes in so understand the codes understand what's there understand that the codes can blur together too like i said you can have a single asset with allocations 121 and 1031. So how long's long enough? Well, this uh, this recent case uh, was a case four months deemed long enough in that situation. So, you know, the bottom line is these people relinquished a property that was held for investment, bought a property with the quote unquote intent to hold for investment. And uh, they uh, bought that property, documented uh, the listings, documented showings for rent, uh, moved into it after four months, uh, argued that uh, through hardship they had to, they couldn't afford to keep their home and an empty unit. They moved into that empty unit, sold the home, got audited, uh, got taken to court, prevailed in court. So four months in this situation was deemed long enough. Uh, I'm going to tell you a year. Okay, lots of times people say two years, as I said earlier, two years is not there unless it's related party transaction. And even in that scenario, it's not an absolute. If it's an arm's length transaction, I'm still, I would recommend a year based upon two factors. One, the break between short and long-term tax rates on assets held for investment. And two, the government's proposed a one-year hold several times. So I think you can hang your hat on that stuff. Even tax, different tax years looks better than the same year. But uh, you know, I think that that's okay. Anytime we're looking at two and three years, 
I don't buy it. Uh, you know, you've got to look at what the person does for a living, how often they're doing stuff. And we'll get to that when we look at the Clarkowski and de determining dealer status. But as it stands today, there is no stated absolute required hold period. Now, this page, we're talking about COVID and holding. Now, you might be living in a spot or you might have income properties that are suddenly not income properties, right? If you are unfortunate enough to have something in Portland or Seattle, uh, maybe Chicago, different areas, and, and the tenants have been told, hey, you don't have, they, they don't have to make uh, those uh, rent payments. Well, who's telling the bank that uh, they're, they're gonna let you sit there and slide on, on your debt payments? So, you know, we've got lots of clients that maybe bought something and now they're in a situation where a tenant's not uh, paying and, and they, they don't want to hold it or they can't financially afford to hold that property any longer. So what I'm telling you is that's a situation where adverse uh, circumstances are dictating a diff different course of action. So you might have bought the thing with the intent to hold over the next three, five, 10 years and the world's a different place. It's been flipped upside down. And if you can justify a shorter period, uh, you know, once again, your tax people, you and your tax people need to be comfortable with what's going on. And then you might be in a situation where you've just bought the property and, and you can exchange out of it. Section 121, the primary uh, residence rules, once again, a hardship for situation allows a proration of the 250 or 502. So if you're in a situation where maybe you bought that big home, now you've been laid off and now you, you, you're worried about it, talk to your tax people and uh, you know, really discuss with them how long or you know, what, what the tax repercussions of an abbreviated hold would be on the sale of primary residence if you're in that boat. Dealer status, okay? The purpose for which the property is acquired, purpose for which the property is subsequently held, extent, in, extent of improvements made, frequency, number, continuity sales, extent, nature of transaction in the property, general business activities of the taxpayer, extent of advertising and promotion of the property for sale, whether the property is listed with a real estate broker or other outlets. Uh, and finally, the purpose for which the property is held at the time of sale as opposed to the time of acquisition. So, you know, what we're careful about is, is you know, if you've got one or two of these against you, I'm not going to worry about it. But typically, a dealer is going to have most of these against them. And, and, you know, rationalize each of these questions. Purpose for which the property is acquired. You know, obviously, we just talked about COVID. That's going to impact things. Maybe you have illness. Maybe you have, a, you know, a loss of, of jobs or, you know, a big dramatic change in income or, you know, maybe something else has just happened. You've got to change that course of action. Uh, extent of improvements made. So, you know, what do you do with the property? with that thing when you got it and during the time you held it, frequency, number, continuity of sales. Now, I've got another, uh, actually a couple of slides ago, we talked about uh, you know, perceptions. There's no restriction on the number of transactions you can do in a given year. Now, what we don't wanna see is a daisy chain of those. We don't wanna see you exchange out of one property into a new property, hold a couple months, dump it into exchange out of that into the next one, out of that into the next one. That's a problem. Uh, you know, for you to buy a property and have uh, somebody come in and make an unsolicited offer that's too good to pass up, that's a different situation than buying a property, putting it on the market, uh, you know, two weeks later. Or, uh, you know, you've got a situation where you've got intent, you've got an unsolicited offer, that's a totally different situation than buying, fix, and turning. So, if you've got a situation where you're very lucky with an acquisition, and somebody else really wanted that asset and you, you know, turn that thing once, you shouldn't have any issues. But frequency, number, continuity of sales is going to dictate you've got a, another issue there to deal with. Um, general business activities, taxpayer, real estate broker is going to be looked at differently than that doctor that's dabbling in real estate. Uh, when we're looking at the extent of advertising promotion for sale, we're you know, sort of looking at unsolicited offer versus active work in these things. And then uh, unsolicited offer is definitely different than, for example, this court case where five years was not uh, was deemed not long enough to have a property considered viable for 1031 because the property is acquired immediately put on the market, took five years to sell. It was never held for investment. On the other hand, as I said, you could buy a property uh, a few weeks or a month or two later, somebody unsolicited come in making an offer, and that's something that's justifiable. So really, that's what our concerns are. Uh, if, if we're looking at uh, that final number nine, 
uh, you could own a, own a property for 10 years, maybe it's acreage, and then uh, in, in year nine of the 10, you decide that you're gonna make 20, 20 lots out of that thing. Well, if you sell them all as one thing, uh, maybe you'd be okay, but you're selling to 20 different people. Now you're going to be looked at as a dealer and you're going to have some issues there. So, you know, platting it out, selling as one is different than selling out all 20 of them uh, to uh, 20 different buyers. I like simple. So four basics. I'm sorry if you've been through this on my classes before, but I, I, I got to make sure everybody on here is in the same place. So we've got four issues that we look at. It's gotta be an exchange. The relinquished and received items must be of like kind. We must satisfy, what we call a napkin test, which says a cross or up in value and equity. And then we've gotta have continuity of vesting. So the exchange timelines, 45 days, 180 days, both start at the transfer date of the property, the settlement date. Typically, if we were doing something, let's say, a leasehold improvement exchange, which we're not going to talk about today. But in that situation, we are entering into a long-term lease. A lease of 30 years duration or longer constitutes ownership of real property. So we enter into that thing, or let's say it's a, a phantom gain situation where property is going to be foreclosed. The property is transferred to us pre-foreclosure. That transfer date starts the clock. It's not when the date, not the date that the property was actually foreclosed. It's when that thing was transferred to us. That starts the clock. So we've got that 45 days from settlement or from transfer date to ID, 180 days total time to complete it. If we're looking at reverses, we're just going to reverse that situation. 45 days from acquisition to ID wants to be relinquished, 180 days total time to relinquish that property and be done with the exchange. When we're late in the year, we've got to be careful. Anything that's, that's going on late in a tax year, You've got to make sure you understand that the, the 45 and 180 days, it says 180 days or the due date of the tax return. So make sure if you're closing transactions late in the year that you complete the exchange prior to filing your tax return. If you're not going to be completing the acquisition, the replacement properties till April 15th, you're going to have to file an extension. But that's one of those things that's sort of a, you know, a, a minefield out there that people are not aware of. So anything late, we need to file an extension, make sure that we're closing the, the exchange before filing a return. The bold at the very bottom, we had never had an extension pre 9-11, but since then, every time we've got a federally declared national disaster, we've got extensions that are issued. We did have a COVID extension, but we have nothing at this, this point in that, that thing went away uh, last summer. So at this point, we've got no further extensions uh, for COVID, but uh, we've had some for other storms, other things going on. Property ID, up to three properties of any value. Uh, you, you need to provide an unambiguous description. It could be a common address, including city, state, and zip. If you're gonna buy with other people's you, people, you need to ID the portion you're going to acquire. If you're buying a condo, it's gotta be a specific unit. It could not be a unit of the complex. So you're IDing up the first rule, three properties of any value. Second rule says you can ID more than three. Total value of the property's ID can't exceed 200% of the relinquished property's value. We're typically gonna look at the gross on that. And then uh, three, uh, you can exceed three, you can exceed 200%. You gotta close 95% of the aggregate value of all properties identified. So understand that both, you know, if we're looking at uh, B and C, those choices both talking about values. And, and, and when I go back, if I look at 1991, I got, you know, we were going through an audit manual and one of the questions asked was, was the property listed at the time of identification? Let me ask you this, does a property have to be on the market officially to be identified? And the answer is absolutely no. So basically a common address, including city, state, and zip is going to be okay. And the property does not have to be on the market. You're just giving that thing as one of those properties that you're identifying. You can change your mind up until uh, midnight, the 45th day. Uh, I'm going to tell you, it's once again, I said it earlier, you are totally committed to completing the exchange on day 45, or you should torpedo it. Don't go further, don't ID properties just in case, because uh, what happens if you find a property you really want and you identify the property, we can't give you the money. So one of these three rules is all that has to be applied, not all three, and if you've got questions on it, give us a call. 
this is the page I want to stress in today's world. And, and whether you want to go into an opportunity zone and you decided, hey, I, I want to set up the exchange. If I don't complete the exchange, I'll shift gears in the opportunity zone, the OZ. Or maybe you're in a situation where you just bought 45 days to figure out whether you could find something and now you're on day 45. I'm going to tell you, terminate the transaction. If you turn in an ID, rescind it. And then on day 46, we can give you your money. Because if you don't do that, you can only get money out of the exchange at closing or after you've purchased everything you have the right to buy. It's called the 1031 G6 rules. So you can ID anything up until midnight the 45th day. So anything's possible. After the 45th day, uh, you just need to make sure that you're committed to buying what you're gonna buy or get it out because it's happened more than once where we have somebody that's ID properties and they come to us on day, let's say 125, the broker finds the perfect property for you and you wanna go buy it and you've identified other properties and we can't give you the money till day 181. So you're in a situation where you're gonna be stuck. So once again, don't let things close until you're ready to have that clock start. And then after it started, be really, really tight on the 45 days and what you want to do. If you, if you know you want to pull money out of an exchange, you can do it at closing. That money is excluded from the exchange agreement and you have the right to it at settlement. Anything you receive that's not of like kind in the exchange is considered boot. As I said earlier, as soon as the boot exceeds the gain, there's no benefit to the exchange. Seller finance. People all the time, well, I'm carrying paper, I can't do an exchange. Wrong, you, you can sell the note to a third party. So basically it's gonna come to us. The note's gonna come to us at close, just like the cash would. We can sell it to a third party. We can use the note to acquire replacement property. Uh, nine times out of 10, our client buys a note. And, and you say, well, gee, why, why would I buy my own note? Because, uh, because really what you're doing is substituting cash for the note. Uh, if you buy the note from us, the note's now yours. It's gonna pay you whatever it's paying and you've got the cash uh, to complete the exchange totally tax deferred and if you've got money sitting in the bank what's it making for you right now virtually nothing so why wouldn't you buy your own note paying five six seven if you sold to somebody in the in the weed, weed, weed world cannabis maybe you're getting 20 percent. but you know i've got lots of people that will sell and carry a contract uh, because they they want it and it's a great investment for them but if they want to do the exchange that note's going to come to us and then we're going to do something with it uh, maybe it's a short-term note. You know, we've got more than once we've had people uh, where a transaction falls out because, you know, financing goes away at the 11th hour. So maybe you need to, just to get the deal done, carry it over 30 days, 60 days, 90 days. As soon as the note balloons and we've got the cash to complete the exchange, the final option is a partial exchange. You're, you're going to defer, you know, the... Uh, you know, a portion of it, you're gonna pay tax on installment basis for the, the note as it comes in. My caution on that is understand that you've got tax exposure on debt relief and depreciation recapture in the year of sale. Make sure you get enough of a down payment to cover those things plus all the closing costs because more than once, you think about Robert Allen, uh, you used to have that book, Nothing Down. I've sat there more than once having a closing where little to nothing comes in on the down payment. Escrow saying, gee, I want to be paid. The broker saying, I want to get paid. And I'm thinking, well, I'd like to get paid, but there's no money there to do it unless the person comes out of pocket. So anytime we've got an installment sale, make sure that if, if it's a situation where you're you're carrying paper, you get enough to cover any of the taxes and, and closing costs that are going to be there. You don't want to get hit with those things at a later date. But there you go, five different ways you can use a note or contract doing an exchange. A few examples here. This is what you're here for, the stories, right? So I mentioned this one earlier. Now they came into us, Las Gas, California property, $3 million in gain, a million dollar tax hit. And, uh, you know, the universe exclusion gave him a $500,000 exclusion, which does nothing in that situation. So there, uh, she was a CPA and he was a, an attorney, but their legal counsel sent them to us and uh, we told them to move out of the house. They moved out of the house, held it uh, roughly a year, what their tax people were comfortable with. And, uh, they had bought themselves a new home, and after that year of seasoning, they then sold the property, took the took what they were allowed via the exclusion. The overage went into 1031. They bought 24 different properties, closed them all inside the 45 days. Why did they do that? Well, 
with 24 properties and the values that they were, they were stuck at the 95% rule, which meant they had to close virtually everything identified. She, being a CPA, understood one sale fail would trigger the gain on the whole thing because she wouldn't have met the ID rules. So she got them all done inside the 45 days. She went from a million dollar taxes to no taxes, got the 24 replacement properties, got the home they wanted, still had the benefit of the exclusion. I think that's a win-win. They were very happy. Obviously, the brokers involved were happy. Everybody loved that transaction. This, this is, this honestly has nothing to do with an exchange, but I, I'm just in a situation where you might have people with problems, and I just want to mention this one. Uh, you know, it, it's not possible to just take, prop, take a IRA or 401k and pay off a property you own. That would constitute a prohibited transaction in the IRA 401k world. In this guy's scenario, this, this was during the 0708 situation, a builder developer had a piece of dirt. Uh, I think it was also roughly a $3 million piece of property, a million two in debt on it. And if you remember in those days, we had banks failing in addition to all kinds of other things happening. So the bank was going to go away. If the bank went away, the loan was going away, the property is going to go away. And so he called up, said, hey, you know, dad's IRA's got a few million bucks in it. Could I take dad's IRA and pay off the property? And that also would constitute a prohibited transaction since dad's IRA uh is is a disqualified party to junior so what we did is we created a new limited liability company junior put the property in the llc dad's ira made an investment in the llc simultaneously now that limited liability company owned the asset had the cash to pay the property off moving uh, fast forward a half dozen years the property was developed into uh, an apartment building jointly owned by uh, junior and uh, dad's ira so that was a great solution for somebody in a problem so if you've got issues with properties in today's world, maybe you've got money, you've got access to funds that you didn't realize you've got access to. If you're a broker, maybe you've got somebody that wants to diversify outside of Wall Street, they can do that. Maybe uh, you just want to do it, but uh, you've got access to funds you probably didn't know. This is an example of it's not all or nothing, and, and I always give this example too. Uh, this, is, this is a transaction we did a number of years ago. Uh, people had a $3 million uh, multifamily uh, project, uh, the apartment building, and it was going away. And they had a situation where their basis, they'd owned it for years, done a, done a series of exchanges through the years, and their basis was only a quarter million dollars. So, so they ended up in a situation where they didn't want another $3 million property. They didn't want to be totally tax deferred. They knew what their tax liability was going to be. The perfect home for them was a million dollar replacement property down in the desert, okay? Ultimately, they held it for a couple of years, moved into it, retired. But they went from a $3 million property to a million dollar property. They had $2 million in boot, uh, which they had tax exposure on. They knew that and they were comfortable with that. They deferred the gain. Remember, I gave you this example earlier. Their basis was 250. They bought it a million, so they still deferred the difference between the 250 and the million, which was $750,000 in gain was deferred, and therefore they saved a quarter million dollars in tax by doing even that exchange. So don't get stuck in a situation where you, you, you're thinking it's all or nothing. As I said earlier, every dollar you spend more than you want costs you a buck. If you don't spend it, maybe it's 30 or 40 cents. Talk to your tax people, understand the tax liability, understand when the exchange ceases to make sense, and that's really when boot exceeds gain. But uh, I, I think once again, do what you wanna do and just understand, be educated, uh, understand what the tax liability is gonna be. 200,000 dollar rental house, like to use to acquire a million dollar apartment. Uh, when you look at a purchase sale agreement, does it say total cash paid for something? And, and you know, this is a boot situation, all right? So. You know, we, we can use, if you look at the first sale agreement, it says total consideration. What is consideration? It could be all kinds of things. So in this transaction, it was sort of a, a menagerie of different items. So we, we had a situation where the consideration for the purchase was actually the $200,000 house, a note, some cash, and then a seller carryback. And, 
you know, the funny thing was that, that uh, you know, it ended up with this situation because, you know, lenders didn't understand what was coming in. The lender, lender just looked at it. And could owe, they were arguing that the only money the guy had in the, in the skin in the game was the $80,000 in cash when that's totally wrong. I mean, they had, they had the 200000 in in the equity in the property, the note for the 120 and the 80. They, they got lots of down payment there. So, you know, the bottom line is they made the deal happen by using all of these things, got the deal done to make that acquisition. That uh, carry back of 600 was replaced with permanent debt. And uh, at that point in time, the deal was done. Our, our, you know, the other client, we had the other side. So as soon as the balloon payment on the 600 came in, the taxpayer was able, our client on the, on the sales side, so our buyer coming in, the seller going out, was able to go forward as they wanted. Uh, as soon as the, the balloon payment on the 600 came in, we had everything going forward. The house was kept, and that wasn't a problem. So, this is the example I gave earlier. So, this was an institutionally structured tenancy in common project. Uh, this is, you know, we did a number of these through the years. But in this situation, you had a series of, of limited liability companies, Tennessee in common. And the bottom line is the property was going away. And so what happens in these situations is in this client's uh, scenario, the, the debt on the property was actually in excess of the basis. Therefore, uh, they had phantom gain on the sale. The choice was, do I want to pay the tax on that phantom gain or do I want to go out and buy a new property or properties of equal or greater value to what was relinquished? So the value requirement on the replacement was the debt on the relinquished property. And as I said earlier, a lot of times people in these scenarios end up in a situation where the tax consequence on the foreclosure is actually in excess of what the taxpayer would have to come out of pocket on acquisition of a replacement property. So for anybody that's got the money to do this, this is something that really is, is, is worthwhile to do. It's a strange thing, like I said, because there's no money coming out of the relinquished property. We don't have exchange funds. The taxpayer is just going to show up at the acquisition of the replacement with the funds required to buy the replacement. The transfer date of that asset starts the 45 and 180 days. This is a situation where we had a client wanting to combine 1031 money with uh, IRA funds. So what he did in the situation or what he initially wanted to do uh, was combine the 1031 with the qualified money. 1031 does not allow exchanges into or out of partnerships. Partnerships are specifically prohibited from 1031 treatment. So partnerships are typically going to be limited liability companies in the, these days, but it could be some form of corporation or you know, limited partnership. But uh, if we look at a limited liability company, uh, we cannot exchange. You can jointly own property uh, with your retirement account, either tenancy in common or as common members of a limited liability company. If you're doing an exchange, it requires the tenancy in common structure, which I honestly like better anyway, because if you jointly own a property with money out of your pocket and qualified money, meaning IRA 401k funds, upon disposition, if there's no debt on thing, you're in a situation where the IRA 401k funds are gonna have an automatic deferral where you would have to excuse me, you'd have tax exposure. So we'd either do an exchange for the entity or using the tenancy and common structure, you personally can just do the exchange and the qualified money goes back in the account. In this, in this scenario, he didn't end up ultimately buying, doing the joint ownership because uh, the, the bot purchase was gonna require non-recourse debt, he ended up doing something else. We ended up completing the transaction, doing self-direct, we, we completed the 1031 into the property as we normally would, he ended up uh, self-directing, going out and buying other things uh, with the retirement money at a later date. This, this transaction I like because, you know, we often have people wanting to get into deals or we have people doing a project and they'd like to have somebody else join the project. And the, the problem is so often our client buys a project and they've deferred gain into it. And if they want to have somebody else buy into it, they're going to have trigger tax consequences. So this was a great scenario. 
in this transaction, I'm sorry, we're a few minutes late, got a few more slides to go. But in this scenario, the broker, this commercial broker had a piece of dirt that was you know, scheduled. Uh, he, was, he bought it with the intent to develop it. And he had a client that did a lot of development work. And so what happened is he bought the property, ended up selling it on a seller carry back to our client who we then did an improvement exchange for. Now, the broker ultimately wanted to be an investor in the property also. So that seller carry back, that no trust deed, he had, but you know, using the, the seller carry back, it gave our client the ability to use all his 1031 money for uh, going vertical. And then after the project was completed, let's go, let's say a year, year and a half fast forward, the debt was still owed to the broker. Uh, it created a new limited liability company. Our client contributed the project into that new limited liability company. The broker contributed the note. So the note was converted to a membership interest in the project. And so now you've got the asset owned by the new limited liability company with both the broker and the uh, developer, uh, you know, as joint owners of that asset. So, uh, you know, if we had the broker buyback in, it would have triggered tax for the, the client. And we didn't want to do that. So using this structure with convertible note, it allowed everybody to end up where they wanted to be. And uh, once again, ask these questions. Don't assume you can't do things. The only dumb question is one you don't ask. Last example, and uh, it's, it's a curveball for you. Nothing to do with an exchange. It's uh, something to encourage you to reach out and sign up for an IRA 401k class. Husband and wife retired, came to us with their respective IRAs. One told us they wanted to go buy a mobile home RV park. Uh, we looked at doing a checkbook IRA form first, and they mentioned they wanted to be the on-site managers and live there too. Uh, both those things would have triggered problems, would have ended up uh, being prohibited transactions with the IRA, and would have converted it to a full taxable situation. And so we shifted gears into what's called a rollover business startup. So we moved both their IRAs into a new 401k plan. The 401k plan bought the, the park. And these investors got a great investment. They got a job and all a place to live all with that one action. And, and I just love that story. So if you've got questions, uh, we've got the answers. You can reach out to IRA Advantage at iraadvantage.com or iraadvantage.net. Post 1031 is a property listing site. If you've got properties you want to get in front of investors or you've, you've got a situation where maybe you've got an opportunity there, you don't have control of it, there's a have one section on there. You can reach out that. 1031exchange.com, obviously for the 1031 information. If you've got questions or need anything on this presentation or anything else, you can reach out to see more at 1031exchange.com. And uh, you know, finally, you can connect to us on any of these sites. If you look at the YouTube channel, or if you type in 1031 Exchange on YouTube, Equity Advantage, uh, you're gonna see everything from life contracts to, uh, well, DSTs, all kinds of stuff. So even uh, crowdfunding. But if you got questions, please don't hesitate to reach out. Thank you very much for taking the time to be with us today. And I look forward uh, to uh, speaking soon. David Moore, Equity Advantage, 1031exchange.com. Take care and thank you. Bye-bye.